You're listening to The Building Code. I'm Tom Houghton. I'm Paul Worth. Joining us via phone today is David Hopkins from JNT Developers. Hey guys, how's it going? Doing great. Great. How you doing? Very good. Very good. David, you're based out of? We are in Dallas, Texas. How's the weather down there in Dallas? Well, it was rainy this weekend, but it's finally starting to get nice again. And and, uh, as we move into summer, it's going to be finally done with the cold. We're happy about that. Yeah, we're ready to be done with the cold. We're having a bad theme. We talk about weather a lot on this podcast. <laughs> it's just because, I mean, it affects the business. It's, it's been tough. It You're right. Yeah. It does affect the business. Especially your business. What kind of work do you guys do? We are a general contractor and we service all of this, you know, all of Dallas, Fort Worth area. Um, and we actually expand into the region as far as certain types of work that we do. Um, but the, the core of the business is general contracting and roofing. So, on the note on the weather, yeah, when it's in the rainy season, it makes things very difficult, especially for new construction. So internally, we, we segment our clients like four different ways, home builders, remodelers, specialty contracting, which would be like roofing, siding, windows, and then like light commercial. Would you say you're pretty heavily in the third, like the specialty contracting? Yeah, I mean, with those four things listed, I would say specialty just because we kind of reach so much. I mean... At the core, it's multifamily and commercial construction, but also the roofing side of our company is huge. And on top of that, we do some residential new construction as well. So it's kind of a large mix. So I think specialty would be the best way to say it. Yeah, that's that's something that we, we work on a lot is because nobody's really just in one bucket. Yeah. A very rare amount of our clients are in one bucket. You, you're mixing in and that diversification is good. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. Um, you got to diversify. It's a callback to episode like three. Exactly. Good reference. Okay. Tell us more about your business. How many employees do you have? Um, employees total. I think we we just made a new a couple of new hires. So I think we're fifteen internally as far as employees go, and then we have a team of like independent guys that do the roofing. You know, roofing sales is a little bit different as far as employees go, but. All in all, maybe 20 to 25, give or take, when the season's at its peak for roofing. You mainly focus on the sales side, correct? Maybe you can give us yes. a little more background on, on what you do. Yes, for sure. So in, in my role, uh, VP of sales, and I also serve as our chief estimator. So you know everything from the incoming lead process all the way seeing seeing our clients and uh, you know any of our investor partners all the way through pre-construction. So that's generally my day-to-day role. And awesome. you said chief estimator. What? Uh, there's kind of two sides of estimating, right? Like the, the system you might use to calculate costs, but also like getting, mm-hmm. like having like a database of those costs. Is that fair? Or? Yeah, exactly. For the database side of it, we've been building that for probably, well, all of my 10 years. So mm-hmm. for five years with JNT, we've been building that up. And then as far as the actual implementation of those items, as far as putting it into an estimate that you could do a client, that's a whole other side. Yeah. And I think that that starts with getting the information from the, from the client during the lead process, you know, using something like build a trend to, to get that information correctly and efficiently makes you that much more successful when you're putting bids together to give to a client. So I think they, they do go, you know, hand in hand and they're both things that have to be managed to be successful. Yeah, we actually just had a feature spotlight on lead management, and we did talk about that through the through the lens of doing it in Builder Trend. But just going back a little bit before Builder Trend or or while you're using us, talk about the process you have. I think I called it like a qualification kind of layer, because you you'll get a ton of leads, right? And not everybody's a good fit for what you do as a business. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about your lead process, like the steps in it, or at least focus in on like the qualification level? Yeah, sure. So just prior to everything coming in, I mean, when or rather when it first comes into us, the word qualify, I, I really like because that's what we teach on our front end too. And I actually called a client interview. I don't know if that's the best terminology to use, but we really like to give our clients the opportunity to have an interview both ways. You know, we want to ask them questions, but we want to give them a platform to tell us things that they've really enjoyed and also th- things that they've had negatively impact them with contractors in the past. So using like an interview, we just, that's the kind of the process we go through. As far as the initial, you know, admin lead coming right in, we just built, you know, a, a Google form that basically lets us put the data quickly into Builder Trend. So it kind of generates a PDF. We have a bunch of pre-made, you know, questions that will give us how to root it correctly in the lead opportunities. Um, but yeah, the, the qualifying is 
I would say the most important thing. And once we started doing that a couple of years ago, we've seen just a huge increase in the overall quality of the clients that we're working with, the type of projects, the fit between the two, you know, the fit between mm-hmm. the, the project and us. And I think that makes it all that much better. Yeah. Wes from Trunk Bay uh, on a previous episode talked about that. It's very important to their business. They're, they're doing high end you know, long projects like custom homes, but even in a shorter project, you really are getting into a relationship with your client and you want to make sure yeah. that's a healthy one because there are going to be ups and downs. And so that's good. What does that uh, client interview look like in terms of a vehicle? Is that a phone call or is that a face-to-face meeting? Do you guys have a preference on which one works better for you? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think for the most part, I would say maybe 80% of the time it's a phone call because a lot of our clients are just not in the area. Like if they're investors, they're outside of DFW, but we always push if they'd like to come into the office or if we could meet them at the site or at their facility, then we love that as well. And, but doing it in that, that theme of it's an interview, it's no pressure. It's not a sales pitch. It's to get, to give them the opportunity to get to know us and take away that, that element of, oh, this is just another contractor that's trying to, you know, sell me something. You know, we really want to get to know them. I love that. We talk about a lot about uh, elevating the industry, not to like put too much on our shoulders, but we do think build a trend. That's one of our initiatives is to bring it out of like the shadows of, hey, every time I talk to a contractor, I think I'm going to get screwed over. Yeah. You know, putting a little bit more um, the companies above the board, right? I think that's a good part of it. So you prefer to do it in person over the phone, but majority is over the phone. Do you prefer to do it in person because it just adds that element of like face to face, getting to know me even better? Yeah, exactly. Nowadays, everything is is so instantaneous and fast, and these little micro transactions between people, you know, text, social media, you know, those things can all be good and used positively. But also, if you're not meeting face to face, you're not shaking hands or I just think there's something that's generally lost nowadays. So I think getting to meet in person is just a perk. Yeah, that's great. I guess where I was going with that for all the listeners and maybe even for you, this, what we're doing right now, because we got you on video, a Zoom yeah. video chat. Yeah. That'd be a good little middle ground for you guys. Yeah, actually Zoom is new for me. <laughs> so um, so we do a lot of design build as well. And our, our architects have been pushing this. So we've done a few of these with our clients sharing the the plans and engineering phases. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of new to it, but I, I really like it because it, you're right. It, it is a good bridging point, I think. Yeah. Right. I don't like seeing myself on camera, but <laughs> Hollywood Tom, <laughs> hey, you've got no problem. With that. That's well, it comes with the name, I guess. <laughs> it comes, comes with the territory for you. <laughs> yeah. But that's a, that might be a good little tip. Actually, for our sales team, we, we're doing hundreds of demos a day. I've thought about, I got to clean them up quite a bit, but <laughs> a <little> bit. <laughs> I've thought about throwing them on video because I think there is something to that element of seeing somebody's face. Yeah. A- and I think you probably would close better as J and T developers. You actually know you, you do face to face. So something for the listeners yes. to think about. Yeah. A good way to bridge that gap. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about how your process has evolved. You mentioned you've been doing this for a couple of years now with putting leads yes. into builder trend. What did it look like before? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, really looking back on that, we just started as basic as I think you can as a contractor goes. I mean, we were entering data into into Excel spreadsheets, into the you know Google Docs in its infancy, um, and a lot of things were still just written by hand. You know, we would even inspections in person. We would go and meet a client, and you would you would write all your notes by hand, and then you'd have to input all that data secondary into whatever system you could find that would work. And for me. Builder Trend, even when we started using it, just just a couple of just basic things, you know, just giving yourself a, a place to put the client's info is is a huge help. You know, not having to rely on three or four different systems plus hand notes as far as your incoming leads and your incoming inspections. That was really as as advanced as it was at the beginning. You know, it was just a lot of pencil writing, a lot of note taking, and a lot of using your memory to try to remember everything. Yeah. Are you guys currently using the customer portal for your jobs? Oh yeah, absolutely. So are yeah. you in your sales process? Are you guys demoing Builder Trend? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. We have a uh, we have I guess you could call it a dummy account. Um, we have a couple of clients that are that are cool with us showing their projects. We always clear that. Obviously, if somebody's coming in, we'll ask them in advance, like, "Hey, would you mind if we showed so and so your project to kind of demo it?" And most clients are cool with it, but when you're in commercial construction. Some clients don't want anything about their projects being known. Like maybe it's a premiere. We have like an art studio that we're working on. They don't want any of that to be known. So 
in those instances, we have a like a dummy account that we basically put up the owner site on our in our conference room, and we just go through it. We show them everything from the daily logs to the schedule to messages. You know what all the features look like. And, and does that connect with them? Oh yeah, for sure. I think because going back to the interview, most clients tend to feel like when they mention something negative, it's been that you know in their past it was that they didn't have communication or they didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they see that client portal, you can kind of tell by their face like, oh, wow, we never thought we could have something like this. And then those fears start to kind of wash away and you can get down to the root of whatever else they have going on. Absolutely. And have you found that during the job when there have been changes and, you know, a common one like change orders or delay to the schedule, but because the communication is really there the whole time, that their reaction to those things is less negative or do they understand more? Absolutely. And we, we teach it in, in, in from sales meetings to project management stuff. We teach that if the communication's there and you can deliver it effectively, those negative things like a, like a, a delay because of weather or, you know, you ordered some tile and it didn't get there. Those things aren't big issues anymore when the client knows about them and when they can see that that there's a clear history of how it happened. It's, it's only when those change orders are surprises that they become this huge negative thing. And build a trend facilitates that easily. Like if you train your client and you show them how to use it and you've been showing it to them since the first time you met them, then they're comfortable with it from day one. You know, this is construction. So things happen. And when there is an inevitable change order, it's not a surprise because they know, they, they know about it the moment that it happens and they don't have to be surprised by it. Right. I think that's a great takeaway because we talked about this before that I think the thought in construction in the past and these days with some people is, well, if, if there's a delay, I'm going to get in trouble or the client's going to get mad and, and that we try to hide things from the client because of that. But I've always thought, and I'm glad you confirmed it and our clients do, is that if you just communicate the whole time, the clients are more mad about being kept in the dark and feel like because they feel like you're trying to pull not not only that over them, but who God knows who, what else. Right. And so yeah. communication is super important. Yeah. I think you're setting those expectations right off the get go. If you are showing the builder trend and showing them how to use it uh, in that sales process. I mean, I, I know we try to really stress to all of our clients leverage builder trend as a marketing tool for your business to help you close those leads. And then also, like you said, it sets that expectation because then they're, they know, okay, if something comes up, you know, there's a change order, et cetera, I'll mm -hmm. take care of that through builder trend. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I think even for us, I, I admittedly, you know, we didn't, we didn't take advantage of it as early as we should have, you know, we knew builder trend was a great tool. And I think once we started really positioning ourselves more for those client interviews and making that a bigger focus on the front end, we realized how powerful it was. I mean, the I still remember the first time showing a client in person, the owner site, it, it changes everything. When you see their reaction to it, even if you're just showing it to them, like on your iPad in the field, you know, just pull it up and show it to them. When they see that, it's just like this warm wash over them and they just say, oh, well, Okay. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's such a relief that they don't even know what, it's, what to say sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a wild experience. So that's yeah. awesome. That's great. That was a whole ad for Build a Trend. But, <laughs> and I, yeah, as a, but I think the real takeaway is setting expectations and communication. Definitely. And you could probably do that a few different platforms. I encourage you to use Build a Trend. Yeah, of course. Helps everybody out here. <laughs> but I think, honestly, again, going back to just the construction industry in general, just a good lesson about expectations and then constant communication because i think we've talked about this it does not make sense to the 2019 buyer that there there is such a lack of communication yeah. and a lack of a platform at all because in every other part of their life they have those platforms yeah yeah that's true there's there's so much out there as far as like the client to do their stuff but you know like there's there's so many different ways for them to communicate and all these other right. ways in their life like social media but right. then like they're this huge project they're doing there's, they don't feel like there's any way for them to connect with their contractor, but that's not true. Right? Yeah, exactly. Pulling on that lead lead question, because I want to give people some perspective yep. um, about lead management. So how do people find you typically and how many sure. leads ballpark me a week are you guys getting in and having to basically layer that qualification on? Sure. And I, I would say we have a huge, a huge amount of leads that do come from like our, you know, marketing dollars, like as far as, you know, Google searching and things like that, SEO. And that's something that the owners of JNT have put money into for years and making it the right way, right? Putting things very precisely, 
for the type of clients that we want. And that data comes from those interviews that we do and then looking at how the projects ultimately end up. So we've taken the basically the historical data of all the projects we've done, what's been working, and then we put that back into the marketing revenue to get the right kind of leads coming from the internet. That's awesome. Um, but we have we have a huge a huge portion of our leads that come from referrals. I would say probably at this stage, it's it's easily 50-50. Like half of everything we get comes from referrals or from, you know, word of mouth. Um, we do a ton of networking events. We do a ton of social media. And uh, just the leads alone from from Facebook and from Instagram and other things like that in the last maybe year has has just gone up dramatically. Can I ask about those events? I, I, I've sure. been hearing a lot of our clients actually doing this as like educational events. Is that what you guys are posing these as? I mean, sometimes they are, yeah. Um, there's there's definitely the opportunity for us to be on like an instructor level to our clients. Like as far as a lot of the events we've been going to recently have been in the, the multifamily game because that's something we've been really passionate about recently. But we've had the opportunity at those events to get up and basically instruct and say, hey, this is how you inspect these properties the right way. This is how you do your due diligence. This is This is how you look for a contractor. So what we've been trying to do is just put ourselves out there saying, hey, this is how you act as a contractor in these spaces. And this is what you look for as a client to find the best contractor. And basically eliminating that bado of, hey, you don't, you know, everybody that's a contractor wants to keep everything to themselves, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, don't share anything, don't don't work with each other in any way, you know, don't give away any secrets. And it's like, the, the way to be successful nowadays is to be open as a contractor. Like totally. We have to share with our clients our process. Totally agree. Matt Reisinger at International Builder Show, he did a whole uh, talk about this where in Austin, Texas, where he's from, nobody was charging for bids, right? Like clients mm-hmm. would come to him, expect to do hours of work. They would then hand that estimate over and they wouldn't get the job or they would. So he, instead of like just doing that on his own to start charging, he got them all together and said, hey, we need to start doing this as a group. And so I think that the the construction industry would serve uh, from taking that step of not trying to keep everything to themselves, but then, you know, just trying to share best practices, right? Yeah, I believe that's true. I guess we're all for good competition, right? Yeah. Like if, if we're in a group of good contractors that are treating clients the right way, there's more than enough for everybody to go around. Right. And us creating a network or like an alliance of like, contractors that are doing things the correct way. And as far as correct, I mean, just, just treating people with respect, being Mm -hmm. honest, being open. Um, There's only good to come from that. And for all of us, not just for one or two of us that are doing it, you know, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, we can kind of change the industry to get rid of all these, these negative preconceptions about, you know, contractors taking advantage of people, or like I said, you know, the negativity that comes on the front end, when you first meet a client, you know, those things can be washed away if we're all kind of doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, we have hundreds Literally hundreds of builders in the Dallas area. Maybe we should just be that common thread. We should get a group together. Get everybody yeah. get everybody to Cheddar's or something, Applebee's, <laughs> <laughs> knock out a meeting room and about a keg of Coors Light, and let's talk every month. There you go. <laughs> All right, we're going to get it back on track because I had a follow-up question because I thought what you said was great about the owners of your business, how they think about their business. So you were saying that you look at not only the sources you're getting, the paid sources, obviously your close percentage there, but then you look on how the job performed in terms of, I, mm-hmm. I only assume, um, was it a smooth job, but, and or more importantly, did you make money on that job? Is that sort of how you look at that to then loop back in and decide how, where you're gonna spend your marketing dollars? Yeah, exactly. I think we like to look at overall client satisfaction, obviously is number one. Mm-hmm. And then looking at looking at things like, you know, you go through Builder Trend, you have your scheduling data, you can see, were we on schedule? Were there delays? But what were they for? And then looking at what, how many change orders, you know, how many, and, you know, maybe change orders ties into was this project a project that had plans in engineering or was this a project that didn't have plans in engineering? Mm-hmm. And then you can kind of weigh up like, okay, so on average, if we're doing commercial tenant build outs and they have plans in engineering, we tend to be more likely on time and the client tends to be more happy. And I think that's where you take that data and then you plug it into what are you really doing best? Find your identity as a contractor. You know, when we looked at our our data, we saw that the way we had built JNT, the way we built our project management system and our our sales system, you know, it, it heavily was leaning towards investors. And we realized, okay, let's position ourselves for that type of client in the commercial realm and in the multifamily realm. It seems to fit beautifully. Yeah, we talked about this last time. You know, there's a there's a certain point in your business that you stop making decisions off gut 
which again is not bad if that's all you have, right. you know, cause you know yeah. your, yourself and your industry, but at a certain point you start making decisions off data Yep. and you have to have a system to house all that data. Like you can't make those decisions unless you have that historical information there, which is really important. Maybe we could wrap up with this. If you could give other contractors, maybe three suggestions for how to best manage your leads or, and, or the sales process, what would that look like? Yeah, I really like that question. I think the number one thing is you have to know your sources. And if you don't know where leads are coming from, or you think that maybe you can just remember, it just doesn't work. Something like Builder Trend, being able to track that is is number one. So as far as the, the first thing, I would say you have to know where your sources are and you have to take care of your sources. If, if you don't know, you know, if you've got a couple of your clients that are just throwing you leads left and right, you need to take care of that client. You need to make sure you're calling and, and saying thank you and, and making it right. As far as that, you need to be able to track your follow-ups. So your second thing is all the leads in the world mean nothing if you can't follow up effectively and you can't stay on top of it. You know, turning in turning in your estimates on time is one thing, but the communication and follow-ups is the thing that's gonna close deals, especially big ones, commercial, multifamily stuff, you're gonna you're gonna wait a lot longer. And if you don't have a system to follow up, you're gonna lose those deals. Mm -hmm. Um, and then last, I think, and you said at the very beginning, ironically, but qualifying your customer. If, if you're not qualifying them, so you take your sources, you take your, you know, doing good follow-ups, all that stuff is great. But if you're not qualifying yourself to fit with who you do the best for, you know, making sure you found your identity, then you're never going to to reach your full potential as a contractor, especially in a market like Dallas. There's just so much going on. You know, it's, it's easy to to take every single thing that comes at you and say, you know, I'm going to do this one and I'm going to do that one. But if you can if you can hone your skill, figure out what you do best you know, know your sources, do your follow-ups well, you're going to, you're going to blow everybody else away and you're going to do it the right way. Yeah. The, the third point of qualification, it's a good book into this episode is that the real reason you do that is not only to make more money and have the right job, but like you could spend 70% of your time chasing your tail with people that will never a sign a deal with you. Cause they weren't serious. B spend the right amount of money where you guys actually make a profit or C, um, or C, you don't want to have a difficult client to work with, somebody who meshes well with your personality and how you work. Yeah, I think I think a lot of times it's easy to get stuck in a cycle of thinking that you have to serve everyone mm -hmm. the same, and you should serve your clients the same with you know respect, with gratitude. Mm -hmm. But but you should be serving. You know, you are a business. So you should be serving those that are serving you and being able to deliver great for a, for a certain type of client. If you can identify that, well then go all in, triple down and go for that. You know, mm -hmm. if your thing is commercial, go for that. If you're better at residential homeowner projects because you've built your project systems that way, then go all in there. But, you know, triple down and go for it, you know, and, and, and know it because you have that data to back it up. Mm -hmm. Last thing, just because I, I just love this stuff. And we've talked about this over and over with people, um, this idea of referral marketing. Do you speak to that before, during, or after the construction project with your clients? Like, do you actually ask for referrals? Oh yeah, I mean, from from the first moment that we're talking to people and we we're starting to gauge interest, we're letting them know like most of the time that our business is coming from that. Like I said, at least fifty percent of everything we we have coming in is from referrals, and we don't shy away from it. You know, let people know, hey, the that is how we are successful. But you're happy if you have someone that you know, if you especially in a business setting, you know, and not only connecting you with like, say, mom, dad, brother, sister, but connecting you with other business relations. You know, if you're working with a commercial client, find out, you know, if they can get you connected with the property manager, see if they can get you with the commercial real estate agent, maybe the broker, like there's so many ways to get yourself positioned better as a contractor in those scenarios than just simply asking for a referral, just like, you know, hey, Send me to your buddies. You know, no. Send me to your business relationships. Put me in front of people that can make decisions, so that I can serve them just like I served you. That's a good point. So not only do you ask for referrals, but you you really speak to who specifically mm -hmm. you would like them to refer you to. That's, that's a great tip. That's even more qualification. You're doing the qualification process right there. We're just qualifying on top of qualification. <laughs> yeah, that's qual <laughs> qualificationception. That's quality qualification. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Thank you. That's good. All right, David, thank you so much for your time and joining us yeah. on the podcast. Uh, we had a great time talking to you about leads, of course. Uh, if you have any more questions about anything we discussed here, please check out our show notes on the show notes page at buildertrend.com slash podcast. Yeah, JNT, what, are, are you guys on social media? Yes, definitely. Uh, JNT developers on Facebook. Um, Georgia Brew is our CEO. I'm David Hopkins. We're both pretty active on there, so you can find either of us and uh, Thanks both Paul and Tom for having me on today, man. I really appreciate it. This was great. This was fantastic. All right, Dave. Thanks. Appreciate you.
Thank you, guys. Make sure you check out our show notes page. Also, don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on The Building Code. Appreciate you.